Hello and welcome to this discussion of Pope John Paul II's visit to Poland in 1979. It might seem odd that we're talking about something from 1979 when we're actually commemorating the 20th anniversary of the end of, uh, of communism, the fall of the Berlin Wall. But actually, the visit from 1979 very much ended in 1989, and we'll talk more about that in just a little bit. This discussion is one of, one of a number of discussions about the end of the Cold War, and these discussions are being brought to you by the American Democracy Project here at IPFW, as well as the Department of History and the Mike Down Center for Indiana Politics. Today's uh, panelists are, in no particular order, Craig Ortsey from the Department of Political Science, Deanna Woolley from the Department of History, and we have joining us today one of the students here at IPFW, Elizabeth Lehman. Well, let's get right into it. Shortly after being elected Pope, uh, John Paul II decided he would visit Poland. Why Poland? Well, there were really three big reasons why uh, Pope decided to go to Poland as his first foreign trip in uh, 1979. The biggest one, of course, is that uh, as Archbishop of Krakow is a native Pole, and this was uh, his way of being able to go back home and meet the home folks, and um, uh, basically indicate to them that they, you know, that uh, they really did support him in, in this uh, uh, attempt to become the first uh, non-Italian Pope in 450 years. Uh, the second big reason is that uh, Poland is the most Catholic country in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, and so it was a way of, uh, for him to go to a place where he knew that he'd have a large base for uh, crowds to come out and things like that. And the third big reason why he wanted to do this is because in 1979, Poland was going through a time of considerable economic and political strife. And it was a way for him to uh, support the people who were living there and to uh, perhaps support them in their attempts to come up with a more democratic government. By doing that, was he trying to stir up the crowds to um, start discussion on communism, or was it just to visit? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, he, he definitely had a, a political agenda there. Uh, he couldn't uh, openly say, uh, overthrow the government. I mean, one head of state going to another country and saying, overthrow the government, that, that's generally uh, bad form. But he could say things. Uh, sub rosa in his speeches that indicated to the people in Poland that he would prefer a uh, different government to be in charge at that time. So what was the world reaction when, when the Pope, first uh, non-Italian Pope in 400 plus years saying, I'm going to Poland, uh, what was the reaction? I'm going to a communist country, I am going to openly talk about Catholicism in a communist country. What was the world reaction to that? Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, well, um, the invitation actually came from Poland itself. And so there was a bit of a um, back and forth with the negotiations to begin with as to whether or not Pope John Paul would actually go. And, and then, of course, you had to negotiate as to exactly what he would be talking about. But in terms of the international reaction to the fact that a pope wasn't going to be going there, it was quite favorable in the West. But uh, I believe that Craig had mentioned before that uh, in the Soviet Union, obviously, they had a n more negative view on exactly what the possible impact might be. That is true. Brezhnev uh, was, was definitely unhappy uh, about him making this his first foreign trip and making a big deal of it. It wasn't like he was going there for a day and then, and then coming back, which uh, some popes, when they, when they go back to their hometowns, they make it a, a much smaller deal. But um, the pope in 1979, going back to Poland, uh, had obvious political ramifications for the for the Soviet government. I mean, they, as an atheistic state, they clearly didn't like the idea of a major uh, religious leader coming back to one of the countries that was under their control. And Brezhnev would have preferred it if, frankly, he'd gone somewhere else. And and so this was not just the, uh, hey, I'm going to go home and and uh, everybody's going to say, great, uh, we're proud of our hometown boy making mm -hmm. good. This was going to have a lot more meaning to it, and that was a concern. Oh yes. Oh yes. Absolutely. Yeah. So the trip was about a week and a half long, uh, 40 plus speeches, interviews, et cetera, that, that were given. Was there any sort of a unifying message coming out of this? Well, Deanne and I actually have, I think, different answers to mm -hmm. this question. Uh, I, looked, I, I looked at this as being resistance to authoritarianism. Uh, the, the Pope had a, a special, I think, moral standing to be able to talk about this because 
not only had he been a priest and a, and a bishop under a communist regime, but he had also been a seminarian under the Nazi regime. He had been arrested by uh, the uh, Nazi government, and he had had to uh, be um, ordained as a priest in secret uh, because of the authoritarian rulers of his country at that, at that time. And so most of what he had to say during, this, uh, during his trip was, uh, again, Resist, resist the authoritarian government. People outside of Poland stand with you uh, in, your, in your struggle against this um, undemocratic government. And um, even though, uh, if we're talking about the hometown boy sort of thing, even though I'm no longer in Krakow with you, um, I still remember your struggle because I, fo I, did, I fought with you too. And kind of dovetailing off of that, um, another thing that the Pope continuously emphasized was that the Poles should cultivate a sense of Polish nationalism that was based upon Catholicism. He really harkens back to a 19th century idea of a messianic, romantic Polish nationalism in which Poland is seen as the Christ of nations. And, and he really makes the, or emphasizes the point that Poland, in order to be a fully self-renewed, self-actualized country, has to be a Christian country. That basically the nationalism that he wants to cultivate within Polish society has to be a Christian nationalism. And this, of course, is going to come into direct, uh, direct conflict with the socialist idea of not only atheism, mm -hmm. but also the entire worldview of the socialist ideology, which represents basically an alternative means of viewing reality from the Christian one. Workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains, right? Exactly. And they, meant, they really meant world, no nationalism. Exactly. No nations there at all. Yeah. Um, when he was invited there, were, was this the expectation that he would kind of galvanize everyone into a religious? Forever. Exactly. <laughs> um, well, the question is, who was expecting and what were they expecting? Um, the people who invited him there, uh, and Craig can talk uh, about this as well, the people who invited him on the one hand knew what was going to happen when the Pope actually comes. Um, and the state was also well aware that the Pope could undermine their authority, and perhaps fatally, because it knew not only was it having material economic problems, but it was also experiencing a profound crisis of authority, authority legitimacy. And the Pope was precisely that kind of symbolic figurehead that could basically, if there was social unrest within society, he could help it to push over the limits. Um, however, it, with the regular people and just regular everyday Poles, it was a sense really of kind of just joyous, absolute happy expectation. Just they, there was, it was almost as though, you know, you haven't seen your mother in 50 years and she's finally coming back, like an old friend. And, and that was really, it was a sense of spontaneous just outburst. Of, of love and affection. And so in that sense, the religious aspect of it, on the one hand, was very prominent in its rhetoric and everything, but also in terms of the people's participation and how they expected to really form this kind of community, a sense of solidarity. That was another thing that wasn't necessarily planned for, but it was definitely part and parcel of the entire experience. Yeah, the, the, head of, the head of the Polish Communist Party at that time, a guy by the name of Edvard Gierek, um, he had been in charge for about a decade at this point, and the country had had so many economic problems that, as Deanna said, uh, they were really having a crisis of, of legitimacy uh, in Poland uh, at that time. And so, on the one hand, he wanted to um, be with the Pope and kind of get some of the um, uh, glow off of the fact that, again, the hometown boy does well. But on the other hand, he knew that if the Pope did too good of a job, that uh, he would look even less legitimate than he already did. So he was, so he was nervous about it. He was trying to play both ends uh, against the middle. And since he was out of power about a year after the Pope left, I think that gives you an indication of how well he was able to do that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, that's, a, that's a very difficult balancing act that he was trying to mm -hmm. pull off. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, to use somebody whose ideology is basically the opposite of yours to reaffirm your position, your authority, mm -hmm. uh, is uh, if he could have pulled it off, that would have been perhaps one of the great political coups of all time, sure. really. Yeah. Now, a lot of people give the Pope credit for bringing about the end of communism. Uh, Gorbachev has said that without Pope John Paul II, that we're, there would not have been an end to communism. Uh, is, it, is it fair? Uh, how did this trip make that possible? 
other than going there, knowing that the message was going to be somewhat uh, revolutionary, how else did the trip to Poland help bring about the end of communism? I'll let Craig take that one. Well, in, in some ways, I think when, when Gorbachev said that, I think he was, he was also playing to the crowd a little bit because uh, John Paul had such a, a high, wonderful reputation among pretty much all peoples of the world. And, and so he, I think he might have been exaggerating that a little bit. But on the other hand, the Pope was able to uh, use the platform that he had to um, maximize, maximize the pro-freedom message that he was trying, he was trying to bring. Um, it had been 30 some odd years since the Communist Party had come into power in Poland. Uh, it was um, imposed from the outside. This is after a long Polish history going back to the 18th century of foreign conquerors coming in and imposing their governments on them or just getting rid of the country entirely. It was a generation plus since the communists had, had come into power and it looked permanent. Um, it looked permanent. No one thought they were ever going to disappear. And here you have someone coming from the outside and saying, look, you can change your government. Uh, if you work hard enough, you can change the government using just moral force. Because as Deanna has pointed out, huge crisis of leadership, real uh, moral authority vacuum in, in Poland during that time period. Um, but we've talked a little bit about what was expected and how people, how their reactions were to it. What was the immediate reaction? Was, did people start doing anything immediately or? Yes. Yeah, Viennese Bishop, I think Koenig said that it was a psychological earthquake. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it really, it hit the society, not just within Poland, but internationally that hard. Mm -hmm. And in terms of, and I don't want to go too far into Craig's territory, but Sorry. especially in terms of um, just getting people to organize, uh, in, in really in that sense, the Pope's visit itself was an enormous organizational experience for people because the church was the main one that actually did the majority of the organizing. Obviously the state had to say this is official, this isn't official, but it was the church and the lay people that really got together. And this is obviously an exercise in people coming together and organizing outside of the state. Um, whether or not they're organizing directly against the state, it's an independent activity. And this is something which in a communist society you can't necessarily have because any kind of independent activity is automatically um, defined as being against the communist ideology. And so in terms of that, just the mere experience of the organization and also the crowds themselves, there are millions of people who would come out to these um, squares, to come out to the speeches. People went on pilgrimages to all of the different places that the Pope would go to. And, and in this sense, just for ordinary polls, this was a profound individual experience, very spiritual, very religious. And, and so they, they felt it, even if they didn't necessarily know what to do, they, they would definitely felt it right afterwards. And I've seen quite a few accounts of it actually influencing later oppositional activities in the 1980s and, and so on and so forth. But um, perhaps the most profound immediate result of the Pope's visit is the eventual creation of solidarity in August of 1980, which builds upon this sense of community, most definitely, in, in basically creating what was a, in itself a workers' movement, an independent trade union, helping to extrapolate it to the entirety of the Polish nation. And it's been estimated that maybe a quarter of all Poles saw one of his speeches live, and that translates to maybe eight to 10 million people over the course of 10 days. That's a, an awful lot of people. Even, even in a free democratic country like the United States, that would be a lot of people coming out to see any political visitor. And in Poland, this was absolutely unprecedented. Mm -hmm. um, we should keep in mind, this is pre Internet, this yes. is pre, you know, well, there's some cable television, but this is not not, in not the way we're inundated today with right. uh, sights and sounds from elsewhere. You had, so when you say a quarter of the people went physically, they actually physically went they to some place where to to hear to hear a speech. Yeah. I mean, you had I mean, you had in Poland basically one official television station, you had one official radio station, a few official newspapers, but that was it. Nobody was going to be, no one in Poland was going to find out about this unless it was from one of these official organs. And of course they downplayed a lot of that stuff. People could illegally listen to Voice of America or to BBC 
uh, or uh, read a Samistat newspaper or something like that and find out about it that way. Uh, but uh, beyond that, you had very few opportunities to find it unless you were unless you were there live. And this is actually one of the really interesting points because one of the um, one of the most uh, incredible impacts that the post visit had on Poland was precisely this feeling of community that was created through these various meetings on squares and demonstrations and things of that nature. And um, the so the state run media basically would film the Pope giving a speech, but they wouldn't necessarily move out to the crowds. You know, so even though there might be a million people in a square, you wouldn't see it. And so it's incredible that it, they were able to create this sense of community, which you really could only do if you were actually there participating in it. Because even if you were watching television, you weren't necessarily getting that vicarious experience of, oh, look at how many people are out there in the streets, because you couldn't actually see it. And so that's just another one of the incredible individual human uh, elements to this entire story. Or, or, or worse yet, they would show, they would show the uh, Pope you know, accelerating a mask, giving a speech or something like that, but then edit out the words. So he would be silently standing back, he would be silently standing back there mouthing words, but yeah. none of the audience could actually hear what he was saying. Yeah. Sure. This. Now, you, you both have mentioned uh, economic turmoil in the country. And, and Poland, although it had been a communist country for several decades at that point in time, uh, those were not peaceful and, and calm decades. Uh, massive worker protests in 1956, 1970, 1976, I think, mm -hmm. if I'm remembering right. What exactly was happening each of those times? And I know they were driven somewhat by price issues, but what else was going on in those three years? 56 was probably the one that was the most political uh, out of those three, because in the mid-1950s, you had a process in Eastern Europe called destalinization where uh, hardline communist elements in all over Eastern Europe and in the Soviet Union itself were kind of being edged out slowly but surely from power, more moderate elements were being brought in. In 56, um, you saw the last of those really hardline Stalinists in Poland kind of getting shoved out of, shoved out of power. And you know, people did read the official newspapers and they would find out that, oh, you know, so-and-so just got pushed out and they would know this person was a hardliner and that sort of gave an opportunity to uh, people to think, hey, maybe we can actually, uh, over, if not overthrow the government, at least get something more out of it. This is right around the time of Hungary, uh, the invasion by the Soviets in October of 1956. Uh, there was unrest um, all over Eastern Europe between 53 and 56. And I said that one was but probably the most political of the three. Uh, 70 and 76 were definitely more economic problems. Um, in 1970, you'd had a, a really stagnant decade in uh, Polish economic history, and suddenly the government decides to raise prices. 78. Not usually a good idea. Not usually a good idea. And, they, and we're doing it all of a sudden, maybe 70 or 80% on real basic things like bread and milk and meat and things like that, when you could find it. Um, and suddenly there were these large protests and riots and in some of the same places that you saw the Solidarity Movement really get started in 1980, in fact. So the idea was that the new person, Garrick, came in. I mentioned him before. He came in as head of the Communist Party right around this time. And he decided, OK, I'm going to try to pacify things by uh, growing Poland economically, you know, bringing in a new economic system. And for a few years, things went really well in Poland. You had uh, large-scale economic growth, you had people feeling wealthier. The difficulty was that most of this was really artificial. It was all being done on borrowed money from Europe and the United States. Uh, this money was being loaned to Poland as a, I don't want to say a bribe, but kind of like a bribe, you know. We're going to be, we want to be more democratic, so we'll give you the money, and we promise we'll change things politically as well as economically. They didn't. but. Anyway, all this money was being borrowed, basically. And then after the 73 oil crisis, a lot of this money was coming due. And so in 76, you had a number of, again, protests against price rises and, and things like that. And the, the after effects were still being felt in Poland at the end of the 1970s when uh, John Paul came for his visit. A very tumultuous decade there. Very, yeah. very. Given the economic problems and in combination with the Pope's visit, who was most inspired to um, try to make changes? Was it mothers because of the economics, or was it young people? Well, it was really the, uh, the workers, and the people who were supposed to be the backbone of the system. As I said before, workers of, workers of the world unite, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the heavy industry factories and dock workers and people like that, they were the ones who were, who were, leading, uh, who were leading these protests. Uh, students 
were less involved in this. In fact, there was a real division between students and workers uh, in Poland during this time period. It's something Deanna can speak, speak more to uh, than I can, but uh, it was really a, uh, an issue that dock workers and heavy industrial workers, steel mills, things like that. So, Deanna, what was, what was the division there? Well, the division was um, really one of the reasons why the Polish Communist Party was able to maintain power for as long as it did, even in such precarious circumstances. Um, the intellectuals, the students, and the workers had been divided since the 1960s over, um, over a number of issues, both economic and political. They basically had different views as to how the Polish regime should reform itself, should change, and what its priorities should be. And in terms of the various uprisings that we had been talking about, 1956, 1970, 1976, students and young people didn't necessarily play a very large role in Poland, which is interesting because they actually played a very large role in Hungary, for example, in 1956. And so the, the young people were definitely involved in various places, but not necessarily in Poland. Um, for the young people and the students, 1968 is really the big point, the turning point for them, kind of a defining moment uh, in which the students launch a a series of various nationalist uprisings which are put down by the regime and at that point fatally the workers do not come out in support of the students so basically it remains a one social group with one social group's needs issue and the students are rather bitter about this um, not surprisingly and so in 1970 when the workers come out and start protesting for better economic conditions the students stay home quite demonstrably they stay home and so this division is actually one of the things that the Polish opposition had to overcome in the 1970s. And one of the reasons why Pope John Paul's uh, visit was such a healing process, let's say therapeutic, because precisely in 1976, 1977, the intellectuals and the workers start to actually move together um, and to create a, a common front, really, of opposition against the regime, which is then kind of pushed out to the rest of the population in 1979. And some of that's based on the common history. The, the, the Pope came in and said, let's remember what our history is. Precisely. And, and, and whether you are a student, whether you're a worker, you share that history. Exactly. And there, nationalism really plays the key role. Because you're, if you're able to meet in a square as Poles, as opposed to as workers, and this is one of the things that the communist regime wanted to do, was to divide these various social groups in order to conquer them. Because if you concentrate on the workers, which are the prized possession of any communist regime, um, and, and you try to apply to the workers themselves, then you're automatically creating various groups that have different interests. And it's going to be very hard for them to come together. When the Pope says, no, we're all Poles, and we speak as one nation, that's a very powerful unifying factor. And the Pope, as a, as a Catholic religious leader, could do yeah. things that, uh, that other people could not, because it didn't matter whether you were a student or a worker or an intellectual, you were all Catholics as well. Mm -hmm. even, even during the bad old days, you know, the, the darkest days of um, uh, communist rule in Poland, at least 90% of the population in Poland would call themselves at least nominally Catholic. And that's a huge part of the, of the Polish identity, uh, even, even now, 20, 30 years since uh, the, uh, the Pope's visit, 20 years after the end of communism in Poland. How did the Pope relate his, the economic problems to what he was talking about on Greater Message? Well, there were two ways in which the Pope could do this, and, and one of which Deanna, I think, was, is better able to address than I am. Uh, and, and that first one uh, is that the, the dignity of the worker uh, was, a, was a big part of his message. Uh, this has been a, a long-standing idea in Catholic uh, theology, Catholic social thought, going all the way back to the end of the 19th century. And the Pope was able to, I think, um, uh, drill, into, drill into that and, and use that as, as a big part of his message. The other thing that he was able to do is he was able to directly address that. He could say things like, I know that life in Poland right now is not very good. Um, you are all suffering out there. Uh, but I assure you, better days are coming. And he could say that as an economic message, sort of on the, on the top level. But below that, there was a political message that says, I, I know that politics in Poland aren't doing well here, uh, but I promise you a better day is coming. So again, he couldn't come right out and say, overthrow the government, put in something else, but he could kind of hint at it. Uh, actually, I want to go back to a point that was discussed just a couple seconds ago, and that's this role of young people. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the pope was known as somebody who really, uh, he's very charismatic, mm -hmm. inspired young people. No matter what country he visited, there were people willing to travel hours and hundreds of miles in order mm -hmm. to see him have an opportunity. 
Did he already have that sort of base in Poland, and is that maybe part of the reason, another part of the reason he was able to bring the, the, the warring faction, so to speak, together? Um, well, yeah, he was known as the Pope of Youth, and, and not many popes actually get that moniker uh, given to them. Uh, and one of the reasons was his very active reaching out to young people. And in that sense, I think we, don't, we need to be careful to not conflate Pope John Paul II with the Catholic Church in Poland, because the Catholic Church in Poland as a whole was actually rising in importance in the 1970s. And especially for young people, um, they were organizing various social and cultural activities, bringing more and more people in the public into the particular church. And in that sense, I, I don't know if Pope John Paul II, I don't know if you could say that he was a figurehead before 1979 for the entire mass of Polish youth, although most certainly the people who knew him, and he was very active in the opposition. He was active in organizing churches where churches hadn't been allowed, like Nova Huta. Um, the people who knew him saw him as a very charismatic figure, which of course he was, but it was really the 1979 visit that, that kind of catalyzed this almost cult-like following, um, just in where he, he reached out to the young people, and he did so very deliberately. On June 3rd, he actually had a mass for Polish youth in Warsaw, and I read some accounts which said that it was like this transformational experience for the people who were there. Um, the St. Anne Square was entirely filled, and uh, he was giving his speech, and then all of a sudden, um, the crowd starts chanting, applauding at one part in the speech, and he just breaks the speech and just starts talking to the crowd, and this was something that was amazing for the young people because they'd always been talking to, not with. And it was really emblematic of his style, that it was dialogue and negotiation. And this was something that especially drew in these young people, that they could, there was someone who could listen to them. And so that's I, the experience of the visit itself, in many ways, helped to solidify that. I mean, just, a, just sort of as a maybe slightly humorous aside to show the Pope of Youth, yeah. he's the only Pope that I'm aware of who has his own comic book. Describing his life. Yeah. And car. He got a car named That's true. He's got the Pope Mobile and too. a comic book. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that that's a, that's a level of fame that few of us are able to attain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, let let's uh, let's talk a little more about the role of the Catholic Church in Poland uh, because it was so important. Uh, this is not something that if if the Catholic Church had not been there, this visit would not nearly have been the visit that it was. What was that role like, say, pre World War II? Well, the, the role of the Catholic Church for a long time in Polish history has been one of resistance. Uh, I had mentioned earlier the, the fact that uh, the neighboring empires basically divided Poland up in the 18th century. And you had uh, an Orthodox uh, Russia and a uh, Lutheran Prussia, neither of which was particularly friendly to the Catholic Church at that time, uh, being in charge of a good two thirds, three quarters of what, what had been Polish territory. Catholic Church became a center of resistance uh, to the rule of both Russians and the Prussians uh, during that time period. Uh, there was a, a big revolt in 1863, for instance, uh, that the church played um, a, a role in sponsoring, is not really the right word, but certainly individual priests were, were very supportive of trying to throw off the, the yoke of the Prussians, basically. Um, in the interwar years, the church was very closely associated with the state, but for, uh, but for a different reason. Uh, and in World War II, uh, the, the church did protect at least some people in the, in the anti-Nazi movement, uh, including Karl Wojtyla, who would become Pope John Paul II. Um, so it, it had always been a, a way of resisting um, outside aggression. And various churches did this all over Eastern Europe. It wasn't just the Catholic Church in Poland. The Lutheran Church played a huge role in East Germany in uh, allowing for space for dissidents to meet and allowing them a, a space in 1989 to start the protests against the government that eventually led to its downfall in October of that year. So as, a, as an alternative space, social space basically, churches played a huge role in resisting authoritarian governments in Eastern Europe and had done so for a very long time. How did the Polish Catholic Church play a role after World War II? Well, the, uh, the Catholic Church was Definitely persecuted, uh, especially during the first decade or so of uh, Soviet rule over Poland. Uh, you had hardline Stalinists who were militantly anti-religion, and the leadership of the church was pretty much decimated. Um, the 
person who had been the uh, bishop of, Archbishop of all Poland was uh, shut down. Essentially, he couldn't speak in public, was really under house arrest for a number of years. Um, churches were closed, monastery, you know, church property was basically seized by the, by the government. But um, things were never as bad in Poland as they were in some of the other places in Eastern Europe and in, and in the Soviet Union because so much of Polish identity was wrapped up in the Catholic Church that they knew, the government knew that they could push it only so far without starting a full-blown revolt. And this was true not just for, not just in religion, but also economically too. I hate to come back to economics again, but uh, Poland was really the only country in Eastern Europe that didn't have its farms collectivized. And the reason why they, that never happened is because the government knew if they, if they pushed that too far, then you'd have another full-fledged revolt on your hands. So Polish communism was a little different than, in, than some, of the other, some of the other places in Eastern Europe, especially, let's say, Bulgaria or Hungary or Czechoslovakia. And on top of that, uh, in terms of what World War II did to the religious and ethnic makeup of Poland, mm -hmm. um, basically before World War II, Poland had the largest Jewish population um, per capita in, in, its, um, in its borders. And of course, during the Holocaust, this population is pretty much decimated. And the Jewish life, which was incredibly vibrant before World War II, is pretty much either people have been killed or they have gone to Israel, that basically you, you have a situation in which that major religious group, which would have presented a kind of counterbalance to the Catholic influence in Poland, has gone. In addition to that, that, with the redrawing of the borders and kind of population movements, you also have a much more ethnically Polish population after World War II. Uh, the Ukrainians and the white Russians that were there previously are now in the Soviet Union and the various republics. And so in terms of the importance of Catholicism, it's really kind of, it, it's been strained and purified in, in Polish Catholic identity um, to a very specific, uh, specific um, paradigm of Polish Catholicism, whereas before it wasn't necessarily so monolithic. That's true. I mean, and this is not just a, a Christian Jewish issue. There were other mm -hmm. uh, minorities who were either drawn out of the borders or who were expelled uh, mm -hmm. from Poland at the end of the war uh, because the, the, the boundaries moved um, maybe 100 miles further west. You had a lot of Union Christians and a lot of Orthodox Christians who had lived in the eastern part of Poland who were now in the Soviet Union proper. And the Lutheran Germans who were in Poland during that time period got expelled. Uh, back to Germany. And so what had been, let's say, a country that was maybe 70, 75, 80 percent Catholic, somewhere in there, is now almost entirely Polish and Catholic, if they have any religious identity at all. Now, the visit was in 1979. We, we didn't see everything change immediately, uh, although it's been considered a monumental moment. Uh, I, I think, uh, what was the expression used earlier? Psychological earthquake. Psychological earthquake took place. Uh, it's not until 1980 that we see solidarity coming on very strong. How long did it take for the average poll to notice a difference because of this? Well, I think on an individual level, um, the effect was immediate. And the question is, what are you going to do with it? But the psychological break, the idea that, yes, now we can do something, now we can affect some kind of change, I think that that was automatically there. The question is, what direction are we going to take it in? And how are we actually going to build upon this fervor? But in, especially in terms of the aftermath of the Pope's visit, um, you had people who continued to meet and talk about their experiences and what it actually happened and it was it was definitely a topic of conversation for many of the people especially since as Craig had pointed out eight to ten million people directly participated in this and, and this means that they have individual memories of exactly what they felt whenever the Pope came and so in that sense as a very formative memory of this new kind of community it was the effect was relatively immediate but then as you had mentioned before it's not really until August of 1980 that you actually create the network of solidarity, and that is in reaction once again to an economic impetus, um, economic crisis. I mean, it left it left a spark in in a lot of polls, but it also indicated people outside of Poland that maybe something can happen to the government's union. This is not going to be a, a permanent fixture uh, of international politics forever. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think many people would have said that ten years later the whole thing was going to fall apart. Mm -hmm. uh, this is 
been something political scientists don't necessarily do all that well. Prediction, you know, We're much better at explaining. We keep explaining. We, like, I keep telling people on these shows, we yeah. explain so much better than we predict. True. <laughs> very, very, very It's the nature very of true. the business we're in, I'm afraid. But on the other hand, it, I, think, I think it did leave a little, little coal, a little ember there in a lot, of, a lot of people that, given the right political circumstances, which did come around in the late 1980s, that was able to catch uh, flame again. What did they do with this spark? How did they react, or how did they physically gather together and do different things to change anything? Well, a lot of this had to be small group kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes people would meet in private homes or on farms or something like that. Uh, sometimes the local parish priest would allow people to meet in the rectory and kind of dis and kind of discuss these sorts of things. Uh, the uh, underground movement also started publishing their own alternative press, uh, some is that newspapers that were um, printed by hand, you know, hand crank mimeos, things like that, um, that were being very widely distributed uh, in Poland after after 1979. Um, but mostly, this was this was small group small group activity and finding, uh, if it was possible, finding parish priests who were willing to speak out against the government which did start to happen uh, in even greater numbers after 1979. Again, they had to be careful about it, and the same way the Pope had to be careful about it, but uh, you started to have um, more dissension, I guess, within the, within the ranks of the priesthood in, the, in, in Poland against the government. So basically, without an existing, I'd almost call it infrastructure, this visit mm -hmm. would not have had nearly the effect that it had? No, yeah. not at all, no. yeah. which, which makes sense. Yeah. Well, and the Catholic Church actually played that role in providing the social network for opposition in Slovakia, most definitely, um, it, which is the other major case that comes to my mind. And even in, in Slovakia, too, they were very, very aware of what was happening in Poland, and they were very influenced by that, although the effects were found perhaps in the mid-1980s as opposed to in 1980 itself, it still galvanized a lot of young people especially to start professing their faith and to start getting organized in church groups. And actually, it's in the 1980s that you finally see widespread social church resistance, opposition, outside of the priests, outside of the, um, into the lay people themselves across Eastern Europe. And especially with the young people and the what is called the second generation of dissent in the 1980s, in Poland, the church provides an incredible structure for them to be able to create independent um, organizations, to create newspapers, things of this nature, all in the sanctuary of the church. And so a lot of young people actually come to opposition by being involved in their local church, their local parishes in that sense. Now, at the start of the discussion, I pointed out this was 1979, and technically we're commemorating the 20th anniversary of 1989, mm -hmm. and I said, well, maybe you could say that the 1979 visit ended in 89. That's when the USSR and the Vatican decided to uh, reestablish diplomatic ties. Gorbachev and, and uh, Pope John Paul II actually appeared uh, together. Uh, is it fair for me to say that? Am I, am I uh, doing something terrible to history when I say that, or to the politics of Eastern Europe? There is, that long inhale by very, Craig makes me think that I've done something terrible. Yeah, well, there's, no. there's, just, there's just a very long decade between 79 and 89 in Polish history where things got a whole lot worse before they got better. Um, because as already been pointed out, the Solidarity Union gets started in the summer of 1980 and there's an attempt at some kind of power sharing government, but then in 81, Jaruzelski imposes martial law uh, and basically cracks down almost, but not quite Stalinist style on solidarity and, and the Polish opposition movement. You have hundreds of labor leaders, maybe thousands of followers who are being arrested and sent off to jail. Uh, you even have some of the priests who are being arrested and sent off to jail. You have at least one who was assassinated by the Secret, by the secret Service. Uh, and things look really bleak. Uh, between about 1982 and about 85. When Gorbachev comes to power in 85, you start to see a little bit more, a little bit more of an opening and things start to thaw a little bit and then things start looking better by the end of the 1980s. But there's a really dark period in between the, pol the Pope's visit in 79 uh, and when diplomatic relations are reestablished in 89.
did I do something terrible to history when I when I skipped ten years? Well, there? as I said, I don't think you're abusing history. <laughs> but well, as the historian on the panel, then. yes. Um, well, actually, uh, as the historian, I will go back to one of the actors in history, Adam Michnik, who was a leading opposition figure. Actually, said that the end of the Pope's visit came in August of 1980, and he made the direct link between the creation of this community, um, this spiritual community, with the creation of a political community outside of the state. Now, of course, as Craig pointed out to me earlier, this doesn't necessarily mean that the story itself was over, but it does indicate a significant fact, which is that people in Poland at that time actually did make the connection between the community that was created by the Pope's visit, which was, as we've kind of talked about, it's political, non-political, um, political coming in from the back way. This is translated into a very overtly political community only one year later, and people are making that connection even at that time. And so in that sense, the various machinations of the higher elite political authorities between the Vatican and the Soviet Union is kind of the secondary story to what actually happen happens to the Polish people in Polish society whenever the Pope comes. So would you say that the Cold War or the Pope's visit was a symptom or a end or would, did it bring an end to the Cold War? Uh, I, I would say it's actually both. And I, yes, I defer to... Way to my, play both sides of the fence. Exactly. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's what I do, gosh darn it. Um, on the one hand, it's a symptom, because there's no way that the Pope's visit to Poland would have had the impact that it did had it not been a totalitarian society. And a totalitarian society, basically, you have the state, which is um, commandeering all means of information, all public spaces. And in that sense, the mere, and, and one of the things we have to really emphasize, the mere ability of people to go out into the public square and celebrate what they want to celebrate as opposed to what the state is telling them to celebrate. That's a profoundly political act. And, and so in that sense, the ability of the Pope to bring all these people out onto the streets had far greater political significance than it would have had the Pope come to the United States, um, where even if you did have 8 to 10 million people coming out, no one would have necessarily seen this as a direct attack upon the United States government, even if it had been rabidly anti-Catholic. Um, but the fact that it happened in the situation that it did, in the structure of a system that it did, and especially as Chris pointed out, at the time that it did, because the 1970s was very, very bad for them. Uh, I, I think that it. I, I think that this entire, the entire reason why we're calling 1979 as part of 1989, is because it's a symptom of the collapsing system around it. Now, on the other hand, in terms of the Pope contributing to the end of the Cold War, I, I would say really that creation of the community that that actually was it's difficult to define and it's hard to put your finger on but but it actually was a profound experience in Poland itself and Poland ended up with by far the largest independent opposition movement um, out of all of Eastern Europe and in solidarity becomes kind of a model for the fact that you can have a separate self-organizing society and so in that sense I would say both I mean any crowd in an authoritarian regime is going to be suspect. Mm. I mean, even if even if it's been organized by the government itself, the government recognizes that you know one or two people in the back of the audience can start something that creates a riot or an anti-government movement. Think Ceausescu in '89. Mm. Uh, even sporting events, you know, you get you know 10, 20,000 people coming out to a soccer match or something like that. That can be turned politi political very very quickly. But here you had 50, 100, 200, 500,000 people. Mm -hmm coming out to hear a foreign dignitary, a foreign head of state, essentially, sending a, a religious message in an atheistic country. And that's going, to, that's going to have profound, profound effects on the survivability of that system. As I said before, it's, it, it lit a spark there. And even if it took you know, 10 years for, the, for all of this to work out, it still, start, it still started that. So let that spark, sorry. Oh, but it's also a symptom of the precarious position in which the basically the Eastern European communist system actually was in, that mm -hmm. the Pope was A, allowed to come, yep. and B, allowed to organize such, such a visit which would attract so many different people. Had it happened, let's say, in 1951, 1952, there's a chance that the, Polish, the communist government could have done a better PR job, let's say. You would have never been allowed. Yeah, in 51 or exactly. It would have been impossible. Yeah. And it would not have had the same effect if he had come in, let's say, 87 or 88, Precisely. when things were starting to kind of ease mm -hmm. up a little bit. 
bit. Yeah. It, it was a, it was a specific special moment in history that made this such a such a big deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there a, is there an overarching lesson that you think uh, people should be taking away from this visit? Is there one essential uh, lesson, Dana? Well, for I, I think that the Polish people took away an essential lesson, and that was that they could resist oppression. And especially uh, when, um, and Craig had pointed to one of the messages that the Pope had about human dignity and human freedom. And, and this is something which was radically different from the communist rhetoric and something we actually haven't talked about, mm -hmm. but which is an important part of the entire Pope allure is his style. The, the man had great style. We talked about the Pope Mobile, and, yes. and you know, there's definitely that. But um, he was a drama student. He, he was a great orator. He was a great rhetorician. Um, in that, he, there's some parallels with Ronald Reagan in terms of being able to communicate. And, and there, in, there, in that sense, you, know, you had a, basically someone who was, had a message and was able to get that message out. And it had a profound effect upon people, because even though it was simple, um, and it was playing upon stuff that they already knew, he packaged it in a new way and they were able to take it from there. And it had some profound political consequences. I, mean, I, think, the, I think the lesson learned from this, it goes back to the old phrase, give me a lever and a place to stand and I can move the world. Uh, the Pope had both a lever and a place to stand. Uh, he, the lever was his religious identity, the place to stand was him being Pope, again, the first, you know, not just the first Polish Pope, the first non-Italian Pope in 450 years. And he, he was able to use that uh, in Poland during his trip in 1979 to try to, you know, lever up the old authoritarian government in Poland and 10 years later replace it with a, with a democratic one. Well, I want to thank uh, the guests. I want to thank uh, Elizabeth Lehman, student here at IPFW, Deanna Woolley from the Department of History, Craig Ortsey from the Department of Political Science for joining us for this discussion on Pope John Paul II's visit to Poland in 1979, which I still say ended in 1989, even if others <laughs> argue against me. This is one of a series of discussions we're doing based on the end of the Cold War, 1989, a 20-year commemorative uh, a series of shows on the end of the Cold War. This was brought to you by the American Democracy Project here at IPFW, as well as the Department of History and the Mike Down Center for Indiana Politics. I want to thank CATV for recording it for us, and make sure that I tell you to check it out on CATV as well as on MDON. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon.